Good morning. Christians in the first century were known for taking Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says they were continually devoting themselves to the breaking of the bread. Christians gathered together every first day of the week and the purpose of their gathering was to take the Lord's Supper. In Acts chapter 20 verse 7 the Bible says on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break the bread. Today we are we are to people that Christians were in the first century. We have the same customs and we have the same convictions and the same beliefs and we are known for the same things. We must be people who are known for taking the Lord's Supper. And we gather together every first day of the week for the purpose of taking the Lord's Supper. But what happens when we take the Lord's Supper? There are a lot of reasons why Supper. Today I just want to point out one thing that happens when we take the Lord's Supper. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a story in the life of Jesus, and then we're going to apply Jesus' teachings to the Lord. It's found in Luke chapter 7. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, and we begin in verse 36. Seven, verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 30 says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Interesting that a Pharisee would invite Jesus to come over to his house. Jesus is having dinner at the home of a Pharisee. That's interesting because generally the relationship that the Pharisees had with Jesus was an antagonistic one. The Pharisees viewed Jesus as an enemy. The Pharisees viewed Jesus as a threat to their, to their power, to their authority, to their pos position in society. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't like Jesus. And so it's interesting that you have a Pharisee who has invited Jesus over to his house. Even though most of the Pharisees viewed Jesus as an enemy, Jesus was very popular amongst the people. Jesus was a great teacher. Jesus taught with an authority that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't even have. And the people were amazed at the power of Jesus' teachings. Jesus was also performing miracles. And so even some of the Pharisees wondered, could Jesus be the Christ? But there was so much pressure put on them by the Pharisees themselves not to accept Jesus as the Christ, that the Pharisees who wondered if Jesus was the Christ, maybe they were actually looking for a reason to deny that Jesus is the Christ. Why would this Pharisee invite Jesus over to his house? My opinion is that this Pharisee might have been testing Jesus. And maybe he was looking to find some flaw in Jesus. He was hoping to find some reason why he could deny that Jesus was the Christ. But he invites Jesus over to his house. Let's read verses 37 and 38. 37. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And kept wiping them with her hair, the hair of her head, and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. This is kind of weird. Jesus is at the Pharisee's house, they're having dinner, and this woman comes in. It's, she's a sinful woman, and she comes in and she's so emotional. She's an emotional wreck. She can't control her emotions, and she's just crying, and she's just sobbing, and she's just interrupting the meal and it's so awkward and it makes the Pharisee feel uncomfortable. He doesn't like what's going on. And it's interesting that she would even be able to get into the Pharisee's house. The question I ask is, how did this woman get into the Pharisee's house? And sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it through the perspective of our own culture. And so in our own culture, this would be very bizarre if you were having a dinner party at your home and some uninvited guest came in and just caused a scene and interrupted the meal, 
This doesn't happen very often. However, our culture is different than first century Judaism. You know, if we're having a dinner party at our home, chances are, you know, we're eating inside and the doors are closed. And for some people, even the doors are locked. And it's very rare that an uninvited guest is going to stop by and interrupt that meal. However, in the first century in Israel, rich people would have had a courtyard in the front of their house. And I'm assuming that this Pharisee is a rich man. So he probably has a courtyard in the front of his house. And the table that they're dining at is actually outside in the courtyard. And so you have Jesus and the Pharisee and some important people. They've all been invited to dinner. And there they are reclining around the table. But it was normal etiquette for uninvited guests to be present at the dinner. You know, people who were not invited to the dinner would show up and they would stand around the edge of the courtyard and they were there to listen to the conversation. They wanted to hear the conversation between this Pharisee and between Jesus. And so passers-by who were walking on the street, they could see the meal taking place, they could hear the conversation at the table, and they would stop and they would lean up against the wall around the, wall around the courtyard and they would listen to the conversation. You see, these people wanted to hear rabbis talk about theology. They wanted to hear rabbis talking about the scriptures. And it's just like it is for us today as well. You know, when a group of preachers get together, they're going to talk about the Bible. They're going to discuss the scriptures. They're going to talk about theology. And of course, you would like to hear that, wouldn't you? You would stop what you're doing. You would gather around the, the fringes of the courtyard just to hear what these preachers might say about the scriptures. But this was a form of entertainment for them. They didn't have Netflix. So they weren't at home watching Netflix on their phones or their iPads, but rather they knew that Jesus is going to the Pharisee's house and I don't want to miss this. I want to hear every word that is said at that table. Maybe even the Jews knew that there's tension between the Pharisees and Jesus. Something could happen. This could get interesting. I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to be there to see what happens. And so they would show up to be there. This woman had every opportunity to be present at that meal. Now, interrupting the meal and interrupting the conversation was not appropriate etiquette, at least in the Pharisees' eyes. But this woman, she, she's there, she's hearing what's going on, and she can't help herself. She's so filled with emotion, uh, she can't help uh, doing what happens. But um, let's take a look at verse 37. Verse 37 says, There was a woman in the city who was a sinner, and when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. Now, um, this woman, this is not the first time she has encountered Jesus. She knows that she's made a mess of her life. She knows that she's a sinful woman. She's embarrassed. She's embarrassed about the fact that everybody knows about all these sins that she's committed in her, in her life. She has been judged by the Pharisees. She has been condemned by the Pharisees. The Pharisees have separated themselves from her. They don't want anything to do with her. But she's seen Jesus. She's had interactions with Jesus. And Jesus didn't judge her. Jesus didn't condemn her. Jesus didn't reject her. Jesus didn't cast her away. Jesus loved her. Jesus welcomed her into his presence. Jesus offered her friendship and love and compassion and mercy. She's never experienced this kind of kindness before. Not from the Pharisees, not from the religious leaders. No, but Jesus was a different type of leader. Jesus received her and welcomed her and loved her. Now, Jesus did not condone her sinful life. Jesus didn't condone the sins that she was committing. But Jesus was there to show her that there was another way to live. Jesus was there to offer love and mercy and grace and an opportunity for transformation to take place. So this woman is so filled with love for Jesus, so filled with gratitude for Jesus, that when she sees 
Jesus. The tears just pour out of her eyes. She hugs Jesus and she, she hugs his feet. And she's crying so many tears that Jesus' feet are wet with her tears. She dries his feet with her hair. And she's kissing Jesus' feet. But she came there for a reason. She came there with a purpose. She had a goal in mind when she went. Verse 37 says... When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. She, came, she went there intentionally with an alabaster vial of perfume. She went there to anoint Jesus. Now, this perfume is expensive. It's ridiculously expensive. She's going to do something extravagant to honor Jesus. She's compelled to honor Jesus. What can I do to honor Jesus? And she does something that's very extravagant. She takes this very expensive jar of perfume and she anoints Jesus. And by anointing the feet of Jesus, she's actually proclaiming Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Christ. And as she pours this perfume the act in and of itself is a proclamation saying, look at Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Because the word Christ literally means the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one. And she is anointing Jesus, proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ. And while this sinful woman is proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ, the Pharisee is sitting there judging the woman and judging Jesus. And what conclusion does the Pharisee come to? Take a look at verse 39. It says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. The Pharisee has arrived at the conclusion that Jesus is not the Christ. In fact, Jesus is not even a prophet from God. Because any prophet would know that this is a sinful woman. And no prophet of God would allow this sinful woman to touch him and, and uh, to, to, to make him unclean by contact with such a sinful human being. Jesus cannot be the Christ. One woman is confessing that Jesus is the Christ, and the other person is denying that Jesus is the Christ in the very same moment. The Pharisees were a holy people. They were a people who separated themselves from the sins of the world. They really did try to live a holy life. They really did try to keep the commandments of God. They weren't out there committing the same kinds of sins that this woman was committing. And it's interesting because the word Pharisee literally means separated. So the Pharisees literally separated themselves from common people. Sinful people, people of the world. They didn't want to have anything to do with these people. They literally separated themselves from them. Now, in the Bible, Jesus is harder on the Pharisees than he is on anybody else. Because even though they were living a holy life from a certain perspective, they were very self-righteous, very arrogant, very judgmental, very condemning of others. And uh, they didn't have the heart of God. And so they weren't innocent. They weren't, they weren't holy in the sense that they were sinless. They were also sinners. It was just a different kind of sin than the sins that the woman was involved in and committing. Jesus, on the other hand, he, Jesus was like the Pharisees in the sense that Jesus was holy and separated from sin. Jesus never sinned. Jesus is the only human being who was truly holy because Jesus never sinned. But unlike the Pharisees, Jesus did not separate himself from sinners. Jesus was free from 
comes with tax collectors and sinners. And in fact, Pharisees criticized Jesus for the company he had. Why is he these sinners? Why is he always hanging out with these people? And if Jesus were a true prophet of God, he would know that this woman is a sinner and he would be like us, the Pharisees, and separate himself from people like The Pharisee had judged this woman, had condemned this woman, and didn't want anything to do with her. And he also judged Jesus because Jesus accepted the woman. Take a look at verses 40 to 42. Verses 40 to 42. Luke chapter 7, verse 40. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, Say to teacher, a money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more. Jesus tells a story. In this story, Jesus is talking about denarii. A denarii is a, a day's wage. So if you worked for one day, a full day, at the end of the day, you would get paid your wage, and that would be one denarii. And so uh, there's a man here in this story who owes 500 denarii. 500 denarii is about two years' worth of your salary. So can you imagine that? This guy has a debt that is so big that it would take him two years of working full time every single day and doing nothing with his money but paying the debt in order to pay it off. How much money in two years? If you were able to work for two years, save your money, how much money would you have at the end of two years? And that's the debt that this man owes. There's another man who owes 50 denarii. 50 denarii is approximately 10 weeks worth of wages. So if you worked for 10 weeks, two and a half months, how much money would you earn in that time? That's the amount of the debt that he owed. Now, one man owes much more than the other man. However, both men owe a debt that they cannot pay. And it's by the mercy of the moneylender that he forgives both men of their debt. Both men have been forgiven. But the question Jesus asks is, which one of these men would love the moneylender more? In this story, the moneylender represents God, and the two debtors represent us. We are all sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of our sins, we owe a debt that we can never pay. There's no way that we could do anything to pay off the debt of sins and be forgiven of our sins in and of ourselves. We can never do enough good deeds to earn salvation. We can never do enough good deeds to deserve salvation. And yet God, out of his love and mercy forgives us of the debt, a debt that we could never pay. Sometimes we sing the song, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And that's Jesus. That's what Jesus has done for us. But here's the thing. Some of us have been forgiven more than others because some of us have sinned more than others and the question that Jesus asks is who will love the money lender more take a look at verse 43 verse 43 says Simon answered and said I suppose the one whom he forgave more and he said to him you have judged correctly it's interesting that, the, that Simon says, the Pharisee says, I suppose, because there's no supposing about it. The answer is obvious. Who's going to love him more? The one who's been forgiven of the greater debt is the one who's going to love him more. But the Pharisee doesn't want to admit it. He has to admit it, so, but he kind of says, well, I suppose. 
Because in this scenario, the woman has been forgiven of a greater debt than the Pharisee. But she loves Jesus more than the Pharisee. And that's the point that Jesus is making. The one who has been forgiven more will love more. Take a look at verses 44 to 47. Verse 44, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Here is a woman who loves Jesus with all of her heart. She is so overwhelmed with emotion for Jesus, love for Jesus, gratitude for Jesus, that she can't stop crying. She makes a spectacle of herself at this meal, and it makes the Pharisee very uncomfortable. He doesn't like what is going on. And how can Jesus allow this to happen? From the Pharisee's perspective, this is not appropriate. But Jesus says, in my own words, to the Pharisee, you know what's not appropriate? The fact that you didn't extend to me any of the common etiquette and courtesy that would be expected. You invited me into your house, but you didn't provide water for my feet. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me a kiss. You didn't do the, the things that, that would be typical and would be appropriate. She's doing more than what is required and you did less than what is required. So the question I ask is, who are you in this story? Are you the Pharisee or are you the woman? And when I ask myself that question, unfortunately, I think I am more like the Pharisee than I am like the woman. And why would I say that? Well, I grew up in a Christian home. I was born into a Christian family. So my entire life, we have been involved in the life of the church. Every time the doors of the church were open, we were there. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Whenever the teens were getting together somewhere, we were there at that house or at that park or at that location. Whenever there was some extra activity going on with the church, we were involved in it. We were there with it. Even when I was playing baseball and my father was the coach of the baseball team, when we had a game on Wednesday night, we would be at the game and I'd play two innings and then we'd leave because we were going to Bible class. And my friends would say, really? Do you have to leave? You have to leave the game? Even the coach is leaving the game? Is it really that important that you go to Bible class? But this was the commitment that my family had made. And this was how I grew up. So I've never known any other lifestyle. Only being a part of the church and being around the people of God and being involved in the life and ministry of the church. I was baptized when I was nine years old. I was not some great sinner when I was nine years old. And so when I was baptized, there really wasn't some great transformation that took place in my life. After I was baptized, I continued doing the same things that I was doing before I was baptized. Because I just grew up trying to please God. I just grew up living a life where I wanted to sin less. Now, I'm a sinner. I have committed sins. But my whole life, I have tried to sin less because sin separates us from God and I don't want to be separated from God. Now, there are a lot of people in the church who grew up like me. You were born into a Christian home and you've dedicated your life to serving in the kingdom of God and you've always been involved and you've always participated and it's the only life you've known. And you've always lived a life trying to do what is right in the sight of God, trying to be holy, and you have sinned less. However, there are others 
who come to the church coming out of the world. People who have lived a completely different life than me. There are people who have lived a life full of sin. They've committed many, many, many more sins than a person like me has ever committed in my life. And big ones too. The really big ones, the really bad ones. And they've come to, to hear the gospel of Jesus. And they were, they were cut to the heart by the message of Jesus. And they knew that in Jesus there was compassion and there was mercy and there was forgiveness and there was transformation. And they so desperately wanted to be transformed by the power of God. And they were baptized into Christ. And there was a huge transformation in their lives. You look at where they came from and you look at where they are today and it's like they're a completely different person. They have come so far and they have been transformed so much by the power of God that it is incredible to see where they come from and where they are today. But the thing is, people like me, I've been refined by decades in the church. See, in the church we have We've developed our own kind of customs. We've developed our own traditions. We've been refined by those customs and traditions. And sometimes we have people who come into the church who don't know those customs. They don't know the etiquette. They don't know the tradition. They don't know how we do things or why we do things the way we do things. They just come in overflowing with love and gratitude for Jesus. Look at what Jesus has done for me how Jesus has forgiven me and, and how he's transformed my life. And they're just overflowing with emotions for Jesus. Sometimes it makes people like me uncomfortable. You know, there was a time when I, I saw a guy get baptized. It was in a river and he got baptized and he came up out of the waters and he was screaming, yes, yes, yes. And he's pumping his fists in the air. And it was genuine emotion. It wasn't a show. Like, he had just been forgiven of his sins. His name has been written in the book of life. He's received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's just become a Christian, a disciple of Jesus, a child of God. He was excited. And he was screaming, yes. Sometimes we wonder, is that appropriate? You know, we don't want to do that, right? We need to calm down a little bit. We need to take a step back. And understand that as Christians, there's a way we handle things. You know, it makes us uncomfortable. But he was just filled with joy over what God had done for him. And, and he couldn't even contain his emotions. And he just screamed out, yes, yes, yes. And I wonder if we have forgotten what God has done for us. Have I forgotten the fact that I am a sinner and that without Jesus, I have no hope? Or am I so self-righteous that I look at the sins that other people are committing? I've never committed those sins. Those people are terrible. And I judge them and I condemn them and I want nothing to do with them. I separate myself from those kinds of people. I'm not saying that we should sin more so that we would be forgiven more so that we would love more. That's not what I'm saying. Romans chapter 6 says, Shall we continue to live in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. For those who have been baptized into Christ have died to sin. So we need to be a holy people. We need to be a people who sin less. But being a people who sin less, we should never forget what it's like to be a sinner who has been forgiven of a great debt by God. And we need to be more like the woman in the sense that our hearts are so filled with gratitude. Our hearts are so filled with love for Jesus and thankfulness for God, what God has done for us that we can't contain ourselves. You know, sometimes we have people who are new Christians and they come in and they're so enthusiastic. And they wonder, like, why aren't we doing more to evangelize the community? Like, why don't we go right now? Let's go out and, and knock every door in Parker. 
and they don't know that I've been door knocking. And that it's awkward, and that it's uncomfortable, and you knock on people's doors and they're mad at you, they're angry that you were, you're even there, they don't want to hear what you have to say, they slam the door in your face. They don't know that I've done that and I've experienced that and now I'm not too enthusiastic about going door knocking. But they are because salvation is at stake. And there are people out there who need to know Jesus. And it doesn't matter how many times the door is slammed in your face. When you find the one person, it's all worth it. So let's do it. Let's go. Why aren't we feeding the homeless? You know, let's take, let's get all, all of us, bring a meal. Every one of us. Can you imagine how much food? Let's go set some, something up and feed all the thousands of homeless people. They're so enthusiastic. They just want to do something to honor Jesus. And sometimes their enthusiasm to want to honor Jesus makes people like me uncomfortable. I don't know about that. You know, and it also looks bad on me. You know, why don't I have that kind of enthusiasm? Have I been hardened by my righteousness? to the point where I don't feel what I should feel. The more time we spend living a life where we sin less, which is the life we're supposed to live, the more likely we are, though, to become pardoned and self-righteous, which is one of the reasons why people in the world, you know, have a problem with Christianity and Christians. Because they're all self-righteous hypocrites and they're very judgmental and they're not accepting. They're very pharisaical in the way they live their lives. I don't want to be like the Pharisee. Now, I don't want to be like the woman as far as her sinfulness goes. But I do want to be like the woman as far as her gratitude for Jesus goes. I want to be more like Jesus, though. He was holy, sinless, and yet loving and gracious and merciful at the same time. I need to remember that I am a sinner and that because of my sins, Jesus died. He died for me. And without his sacrifice, there's nothing that I can do to earn my salvation or deserve to be saved. It's only because of what Jesus has done that I have any hope in the presence of God. So, we gather together every first day of the week. We take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And the Lord's Supper reminds me that I am a sinner. And I have no hope apart from Jesus. And I need to be reminded of that because I don't want to become calloused and hardened in my heart. I want to have a tender heart, and I want to be grateful for what God has done for me. And I need that reminder every single week to realize that blood was shed so that I could be forgiven of my sins. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And that was Jesus. And that's what Jesus has done for us. I need to overcome my own self-righteous mindset and remember that I am a great sinner, but he is a great savior. If you are here this morning and you realize that you are a sinner separated from God, we want you to be reconciled to God. We want you to be forgiven of those sins. And you can become a Christian and you can be forgiven if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if you repent of your sins and you confess your faith in Jesus, then you can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to have all spiritual blessings which are found in Jesus. If you are like this woman overflowing with gratitude for Jesus and you want that forgiveness, then we invite you to come forward at this time as we stand and sing the invitation song.